action. Welcome to Our Sport. I'm your host, Larry Ola. Week zero is in the books as we start the 150th season of college football. Uh, as I mentioned in our inaugural podcast, uh, this is a joint production. Uh, my son, John, is involved in this podcast, or uh, video channel, I should say. Um, he does all the production work, all the editing. I just do the content. How are you? Doing good. How are you? We had a, a, one of the things we argued about. He actually likes Daniel Jones from the Giants. Okay, I don't like Daniel Jones. Okay. Let's set the record straight. I just don't think he was that bad of a pick, okay? I had him a lot higher than other people, high second rounder, or most people had him late second to early third, and I don't know, I just think he was safer than a lot of the other draft picks. And you compare him to? Alex Smith, you know, captain check down, does what he's supposed to do, doesn't throw picks, maybe a little bit less athletic, but I, I see the similarities. Okay, good. Get a haircut. So, um, I don't like Jones, I think he's going to be an atrocity as an NFL player, but that's just my take. So, we had two games this weekend, uh, Florida and Miami, King Golf in Orlando, a neutral site game. This was a rivalry they played for a long time, about 50 years straight almost, and um, inexplicably stopped. Uh, the, the year Miami won their first national championship, game one, they actually got blown out by uh, the Gators, won the rest of their games, beat Nebraska. Howard Stellenberger uh, was the coach. That was their first national championship of five. And it's good to see this rivalry played again. They scheduled a home and home, uh, I think in 2025, 26. And um, I, this is one Texas, Texas A&M, you should come back. Oklahoma, Nebraska was a great rivalry, you should come back. But uh, we're getting off topic. So Florida wins this game. Um, I don't think it's a very profess, uh, impressive performance by Florida. If you're a Gators fan, you take the win. Uh, you have to love what the pass rush did. Uh, 10 sacks, 16 tackle for loss. Miami's coach, Manny Diaz, this is his nightmare. He loves tackles for loss, and his team got bitten by it. And the Miami uh, offensive line were playing freshmen at both tackle spots. They were equal opportunity turnstiles. Everybody from Florida seemed like they got a sack. Florida didn't have one player that got six sacks. It was a bunch of players. Everybody succeeded against them. You couple that with a redshirt freshman quarterback that might have been holding the ball a little too long. Uh, and it's, this is a common week zero trait. It, you'll, you'll have a special team disaster somewhere on opening weekend. Usually in the first game, your the special teams are the most vulnerable to mis miscues. And sure enough, Miami's Jeff Thomas must a punt at the 11-yard line in the third quarter, and Florida is an instant scoring range, and that's it. And that was the difference in the game. They scored that touchdown. They won by four points. They had an 11-yard touchdown drive. They made it. Hey, Miami made it very easy for them. Now, as to where these teams go, if I'm a Miami fan, I'm actually more encouraged. This is a, a quarterback's first game, a coach's first game. They were, I think, seven and a half point underdogs. They played great. If it wasn't for that muff punt, you don't know if they don't win this game. And they represented themselves very well. Their schedule going forward, pretty easy, considering, compared to Florida anyway. They have a game against Virginia. They have the road game at Florida State. Now, if I'm a Gator fan, I'm actually somewhat concerned. The pass rush did look great. But the offense sputtered, had two big plays, and Florida seems to have uh, kind of a circus clown at quarterback. He, Felipe Franks, cares a little too much about what people think. He seems like he's checking his his, uh, his Twitter mentions more than anything else. And Dan Mullen will walk wonders with a quarterback, especially one with mobility, but their schedule is tough. They have Tennessee coming up. They have at LSU. They have Auburn, Georgia, the neutral site game. That is a, that is a difficult schedule when your quarterback can give you some erratic play and you wonder where his mind is. But you take the win if you're the Gators. You're happy to have the win, considering. Any, any win over a rival is great, and uh, you just try to build on what you have. Miami doesn't seem like they have too much further to go. The defense is great. It's always going to be good under Manny Diaz. They just got to show up that protection. Maybe get the quarterback get the ball out a little quicker. The night game, the second game, this is a fun game. I stayed up till. 2.30 in the morning, I watched the whole thing. I could have recorded it watched the next day. I didn't. You could probably tell from the bags under my eyes. I got no sleep. 
But Arizona went to Hawaii, to the islands, uh, to play the Rainbow Warriors. They were favored, and they were not ready to play. Hawaii was. Uh, Hawaii coach Nick Rolovich, he just came out firing. He had his quarterback just start throwing the ball up and down the field, and it worked great. They got up to a pretty big lead that they really never got rid of. But Cole McDonald, Hawaii's quarterback, kept turning the ball over, over and over again. It's, it's a strange stat line when your quarterback has 378 yards, four touchdowns, and then you decide to bench him because he throws four turnovers. I mean, uh, four interceptions, I should say. Um, the turnover margin for Arizona was, was plus four overall, and they lost this game. Now, when you have a plus four turnover margin, you're talking about about a 90% chance to win the game statistically, over 90%. Somehow Arizona lost this game. They came out flat. They were not ready for this. They, uh, they had this three-man pass rush that Arizona fans complained about all last year, and they were getting somewhat excited, the Wildcat fans, because they said there was going to be a lot more four-man rush. The three-man rush was there the whole time. No pressure. No pressure on Hawaii's quarterbacks. This killed them. Um, and in fact, I don't think they even got a sack till late in the game, kind of a meaningless sack. And I believe they only got one, one hurry in the game. Now, defense did get four interceptions. That's pretty good. You, you sacrifice, I guess, one for the other. But looking ahead, Arizona's in trouble. Um, they've got winnable Pac-12 games against uh, Oregon State and Colorado on their schedule. They need to win those games to go to a bowl. The rest of the Pac-12 is too deep and too talented. The good thing for them is Khalil Tate looks a lot better than last year. He looks healthy. Last year, you could tell he was hurt. He was not running hardly at all as opposed to the year before where he was just going up and down the field. He had 100 yards in this game. J.J. Taylor is a good running back. It took them a while to get going offensively. It just took them a while to get in the rhythm. Hawaii, on the other hand, uh, you know, two years ago, they come off a bad year, and so last year they're supposed to be terrible, and Nick Rolovich breaks out the run and shoot on everybody, gets them to a bowl, kind of surprises people. They have a, This is a big win for a mid-tier Mountain West program. Uh, you get a, a Pac-12 team at your stadium, you get a win. They play at Oregon, or, uh, Oregon State next. That is another winnable game. They could have uh, two pelts on our walls for, for Pac-12 victories. Then they go at Washington, so that'll end. Still, this is a great start for them. They have to win a couple tough road games in a Mountain West conference, and they can make some noise. I don't think they can win the conference, but they can do some damage. Let's talk about what I think is the most overrated team in the country. It's the Michigan Wolverines. There's no doubt they're a good team. They've had double-digit wins three of the last four years. There's no doubt Jim Harbaugh is a good coach. He's had success everywhere he's been, and many times it's been incremental success, which is what you want to see. The team he coaches starts off poorly when he inherits it, and they get better year by year. This has been um, what he's done everywhere he's been. But the difference is, when he was coaching at Stanford, his first year there, they pulled a huge upset. They beat USC as a 41-point underdog, that was one of the great college upsets of all time. Um, they weren't supposed to win that game. Two years later, they're 10-point underdogs. They go into USC again, and they put 55 points on them. They run up and down the field against USC, and USC was in the midst of their dynasty under Pete Carroll. So they were, USC was the favorite team. Stanford was not supposed to do this. But Michigan under Harbaugh are cupcake killers. Um, they're 0 and 5 as underdogs. They don't pull any upsets. They beat all the teams they're supposed to do, which you have to give them credit for. Um, as beat them handily. They'll kill a Maryland or a Rutgers, but they cannot beat good teams. They are 1 and 8 against top 10 teams. Now, when you're hired at Michigan, you're hired to win regardless of where your favorite one, your underdog. This year, Ohio State is probably going to be an underdog to Michigan. And, and Wolverines have a lot of advantages. They're at home. They have a senior uh, returning quarterback. Ohio State has a new coach. They have a new starting quarterback. They're on the road. They have every advantage uh, 
tilted against them. But you're not supposed to beat Ohio State when you have Michigan when you have every advantage. You're supposed to beat them when you don't have advantages. That's why you get hired at a program like this. So, let's talk about the game last year against Ohio State. This was a terrible game for them. They were favored in this game. And when you have one common opponent, let's say Florida plays Florida State every year. Let's, let's uh, say they have them play Maryland. And you could look at how Florida did against Maryland. And you can look at how Florida State did against Maryland. And you, you can't really compare because of the transit of property. But Michigan and Ohio State are in the same division. So they had many common opponents. And invariably, every time that Ohio State struggled with a team last year, Michigan played great against that team. Uh, Maryland, Michigan State. Because, especially because they're in the same division, they, they had many of the same teams that they played. So you had this collection of data points that would tell you that Michigan was better than Ohio State. You had six or seven or eight examples against exact same competition that would let you compare how good these teams were. Michigan was not supposed to lose that game, and Michigan did not lose. They got blown out. So they got out coached in that game. You can't deny it. They got out coached on both sides of the ball. And what happened after that, I think, is that Jim Harbaugh panicked. It was a defensive collapse as much as an offensive collapse. They gave up 62 points. But the defense for Michigan was great all year. They did have one bad game. They didn't make adjustments well against Ohio State, that's true. But it wasn't the, the defense, they changed, it was the offense. They had a complete offensive overhaul. They hired a new offensive coordinator, Josh Gaddis, from Alabama, um, a well-respected assistant. The, they were putting the offense in his hands entirely. And they're going away from what Michigan has traditionally run. Traditionally, aside from the Rich Rodriguez era, for the last 40, 50 years, Michigan has been a two-back offense. Michigan has been an under-center offense, uh, the, the play-action pass, the NFL concepts. And now they're running an RPO scheme. Now they're running basically a gimmick. They're doing what Oregon does, where you look over there on the sideline and there's an assistant coach who's holding up uh, a, a place card that has Daffy Duck or a battleship on there. And my contention is that they're making a mistake by doing this. Because the problem was not the scheme, the problem was the personnel. If you look at Michigan's offensive line, they're well regarded this year because they have a number of returning starters. That's how they're judged as, as being a good offensive line. They played well last year, those numbers were inflated against inferior competition. And because they have a, a, a large number of returning starts, they're considered a good offensive line. They're not. They're not a good offensive line by Michigan standards. Because aside from Ben Bredesen and perhaps Cesar Ruiz, these are not the type of players that Michigan had when they're running what they used to run before the shift. They had first-round picks at offensive line. They had John Jansen. They had Jake Long. They had great players, Dan Deardorff, Taylor Lewan. They have great lineage at offensive line as any program in the country aside from USC, hit maybe one or two others. So you also have a running back, Karan Higdon, who was on a team last year running behind this offensive line. He's also not the type of running back that Michigan has had historically. Michigan historically has had prototype, big, fast, complete NFL backs. Um, Tim Biakabatuka running for 300 yards against Ohio State. Uh, Chris Perry, Doug Walker Award winner, running up and down the field against Ohio State on the 100th anniversary of the game. Tyrone Wheatley, Tyrone Wheatley was a monster. Tyrone Wheatley was a 630, uh, 6'3", 230-pound running back who was breaking off 80-yard runs in a Rose Bowl. And that's not what Karan Higdon is. So the problem is not the scheme. The problem is the personnel. The problem is that you have Karan Higdon running behind Michael Oenyo, who's 350 pounds and soft. 
This offensive line is soft. You could see it. You could see it in the first game against Notre Dame. We were there for that game. You could see it in the game against Ohio State. They got bullied. They got bullied against good teams. Michigan State uh, was an outlier. They played well against Michigan State, which they have not done in a while. You have to give them credit for that. So my contention is that this is a recruiting problem uh, as much, much more than a scheme problem. This is a personnel problem. This is not a schematic problem. If Michigan gets true NFL offensive linemen, first, second round pick type of offensive linemen, they've had plenty in the past. Dan Deardorff, Mike Kent, legend, Steve Everett, playing with a broken jaw against Ohio State. And then you put the typical Michigan running back behind them, as opposed to somebody like a Chris Evans or Karan Higdon, you're gonna have a better offense you're going to have the offense you want that can compete with any defense in college football. And that's what I think Michigan's biggest problem is. I don't think it's their only problem. Speaking of Karan Higdon, he was a captain. Devin Bush was a captain. Both of these captains quit the team and didn't play in their ball game. They were healthy. This, to protect their NFL stock. Their NFL stock mattered more than playing for their team. You can say what you want about this. Devin Bush ended up being a first round pick, I believe the number 10 pick in the draft. Karan Higdon did not have the talent to be a premier NFL back or even a high round draft pick. And everybody knew it, probably himself. He ended up not getting drafted. So you had a captain of your team decide to quit before the bowl game to not get drafted. Now you have to wonder about the process that Michigan uses to elect captains. Unless I'm wrong, I could be wrong here, the team elects the captains. And if Michigan does this this way, and I believe they do, this is a mistake. Because you're allowing the team to dictate what you want uh, uh, its behavior to be like. That should not happen. The coaches should dictate what the team's behavior should be like. The coaches should be the ones who elect the captains because the coaches will then say, this person is captain and this is who you emulate. You don't emulate the person who quits on you when you need them. Chase Winovich wasn't voted the captain. Uh, there were rumors that uh, some players on his team didn't like Chase Winovich. But Chase Winovich was a great player. He was a great player. Honestly, so was Devin Bush. He was a fantastic player. Um, and they both played hard. All those players played hard. But you, you can't worry about if somebody is not liked in your locker room as to, to whether he could be a captain or not. Taylor Lewan was not liked reportedly by many of his teammates. But when you watch Taylor Lewan play against Michigan State, he made that a war. Michigan, under Rich Rodriguez in that game, under Brady Hoke, I should say, I believe, got bullied. They got pushed up and down the field. Not Taylor Lewan. Taylor Lewan wanted to make it a fist fight. He wanted to get dirty. He wanted to get penalized and, or not get caught. But that, he had the performance that the rest of the offensive line couldn't. Chase Winovich played great this year. He needed surgery. And he could have skipped the bowl game. He elected to play the bowl game while still needing surgery. That's the person you want as a captain. That is who you want the team to emulate. Another problem with Michigan this year is the schedule. They say this is an advantage because Michigan has Michigan State, Notre Dame, and Ohio State at home. Jim Harbaugh has lost four home games. He's lost to Michigan State in Ohio State every time he's played them in the big house. He could lose to them because he has. He has a game against Army early on. Army's a terrible game to play. Ask Oklahoma, they took them to overtime and almost beat them. Um, he has a road game at Penn State. The very next week, Michigan plays at home against Notre Dame. Notre Dame is on a bye while, while the Wolverines are playing Penn State. The schedule does not favor them either. You combine that with an offensive line that I said before, my contention is they're soft. 
and they don't have the proper NFL players. You have a player like John Runyon at left tackle. Runyon's a good player, but Runyon is very reminiscent of Mason Cole. Mason Cole played on the edge against Joey Bosa, and Mason Cole got killed. It's not Mason Cole's fault. He just wasn't good enough, and he was their option. John Runyon has a very similar build and skill set to Mason Cole. And he's Michigan's left tackle this year. He's going to be playing against A.J. Epinenza from Iowa, who's likely to be a first-round pick, a defensive end. Defensive end Kenny Willickis from Michigan State, probably going to be a first-round pick. Chase Young from Ohio State, almost certainly going to be a first-round pick. The Notre Dame kid, whose name I can't pronounce. And you're going to have these mismatches. This offense will be exposed because of the weaknesses there. It's, it's personnel weaknesses. It's not schematic weaknesses. The, I don't believe the scheme will help fix these issues. Now, I want to point out the good points for Michigan, and they do have them. Um, they have a great defensive coordinator. Don Brown had a bad game against Ohio State. They didn't make adjustments in that game. But you, he's, he's a veteran coach. His defenses have really been awesome for the last three years. You can trust that he'll do enough to, to, to fix the problems they had. There's, there's talk that they're, they're making a, a little more, not a philosophical shift, but they're being a more variable schematically. They're not being as rigid as they were. They needed that. And they have some great players. You see Nico Collins. Nico Collins is a big receiver. Nico Collins is a big receiver with speed. You tend to see somebody like that, and you think that he's a plotter. He's not a plotter. He reminds me somewhat of Mike Evans. And there were times last year where he would go by a defensive back. He'd be Julian Love for Notre Dame on the bomb. The, the ball is underthrown by Shea Patterson. Shea Patterson's another example of a good player, not a great player. He's was guarded as a five-star quarterback. So is Tua from Alabama. Um, they're not the same player. You can tell by looking at them. So, M Michigan, of course, is going to do well. They're going to win 10 games, probably, maybe nine. But they are not a playoff team. This is not a top 10 team. And there's no certainty that they're going to even win this division, much less the Big Ten, which they have not done in the last four years. So, I spoke in a few generalities. You have to forgive me. Um, I did it for context. I know what Oregon runs. They don't run the RPO anymore. I know what they want to increase the ball. They're more of a power set now. And they've had some running backs that were actually a little bit like Karan Higg and the Jamie Morris's of the world, the Mike Hart's. Um, again, generally, Michigan has a big, fast NFL running back, historically. Always have for years and years. But I think it... it their problem, in essence, comes down to the, to the culture that Jim Harbaugh has put in. He clearly doesn't take the Ohio State game seriously enough. And, you know, he has this habit he does where he praises his team. He says good things about his players a lot uh, to the press, media days. And I don't understand the point of doing this. When you have a player go to Michigan... Generally, he's a four or five star player, at least half the time. He's possibly been scouted since the ninth grade, or out he, for scholarships since the tenth or eleventh grade. He doesn't need praise. He doesn't need to be told how good he is. You try to imagine Nick Saban talking about how great all his players are. I just don't understand the point of that. Why you would do that for your team? I would think that if you're an elite program like Michigan, who, when you play teams, you're you're their Super Bowl. I would think that you would say, well, I like these, these players, they're good kids, and you think they're a great team, but they haven't proven anything to me yet. And that would be, it seems to me, be better motivation than telling them how good they are. But if you want to boil it down in essence, I think that this job is too big for Jim Harbaugh. I think the job in Michigan is too big for him. Um, he had all this fanfare coming in, and... I simply don't think that he can handle this job to the, to the level that the fans expect it to, which is national championships or at least Big Ten championships. Conversely, let's talk about what I think is the most underrated team in college football. 
I think it's the Florida State Seminoles. And I think it comes down to one reason. They did struggle last year. They made a change at offensive coordinator. And they hired Kendall Bryles, who is uh, the son of former Baylor coach Art Bryles. He's had scandal in his history where I'm not discussing that here. It's not the point. I'm just talking about his ability to coach football. So he was an offensive coordinator under his father at Baylor uh, in the last few years of Art Brawl's tenure. The offense kept getting better at Baylor year after year. And under Kendall Brawls, their high point might have been the, the Russell Bowl against North Carolina in 2015. They had two quarterbacks out. They had Corey Coleman out, who was a first-round pick at receiver. They had their starting running back out. And they had to come up with something. And they surprised North Carolina. Basically almost got in the single wing. And with no quarterbacks, ran for 645 yards. 645 yards rushing without your feature back. So after the scandal, he's unemployed. Uh, as opposed to his father, who is now completely unemployable. But Kendall Bryles goes to Florida Atlantic under Lane Kiffin. And before he got there, they're averaging 26.4 points a game. He gets there, they go up to 40.6. That's more than two touchdowns per game average scoring. You, you, it's hard to find one factor or one thing that can change your scoring by two touchdowns more a game over a season. That's an enormous amount of increase. And he did yeoman's work at Florida Atlantic. He turned Devin Singletary, Devin Singletary was a good back, but he turned him into a 32 touchdown scoring machine. <laughs> 32 touchdowns in a single year for Motor Singletary. The minute he leaves, Browse leaves Florida Atlantic the next year, they drop 10 points a game scoring. Their average scoring margin, uh, scoring offense goes down 10 full points a game. That's usually the impact before and after him. He goes to Houston after Florida Atlantic the next year, last year, and they're averaging about 28 points a game. They're more than two touchdowns better at this point. Their, their scoring margin increased 15.6 points a game more. Just scoring like crazy. He had a quarterback, Derek King, and got injured in his 11th game. He had 50 touchdowns at that point combined. 50. So, Bryles has gone from Florida Atlantic to Houston. He's now a coordinator at Florida State. And Florida State's biggest problem, they had plenty of them, but their biggest problem was the offense. And I just think Kendall Brawl's a complete game changer. There have been a lot of coaches, assistants that have switched places this uh, offseason. We mentioned Josh Gaddis, among many others. But this is the most underreported coaching hire, the most significant coaching hire, I think, of the entire offseason. What he can do, if he can get him up to what he normally does, which is two touchdowns more a game than he had before, they're going to be at about 36 points a game scoring. That's a huge increase from what they were. They do have some problems on defense they have to fix. But they don't really have that much competition in their schedule. They're playing a Boise State team in the opener who lost a lot of production. And it's a, a neutral site game in name, but it's in Jacksonville. That's a Florida State home crowd. They play at Virginia, which should be an underrated kind of great game. Virginia's got a great defense, a first-round corner in Bryce Hall. They play Clemson, and they play at Florida. And... I just think this team is going to look totally different with Bryles as offensive coordinator. I think he's an amazing talent, and he's going to make a, a massive difference in uh, the Seminoles' year. Thank you for joining us this week. That's our sport. We're going to be here every week from now on. Me and John, we, are on a, we have a Facebook group page, Our Sport College Football. Find us. We're on Twitter now, Our Sport 3 And we look forward to seeing you next week.